Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome to the annual high level meeting on ocean, which this year is both an important step towards COP26 in Glasgow and marking the launch of the Ocean Stewardship Coalition of the UN Global Compact. As you know, we normally meet in person here at the UN United Nations headquarters. While we cannot be together in person, I am nonetheless excited to be with you today with this great group of ocean stakeholders to launch the coalition and the exciting next phase of the Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform from the UN headquarters virtually. We will also discuss the importance of the ocean in addressing the twin crises of biodiversity and climate change, as well as delivering on all 17 of the global goals. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Her Excellency, Ms. Arna Solberg, Prime Minister of Norway, to provide some opening remarks. Please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a sustainable ocean economy where protection, production and prosperity go hand in hand. Stewardship of the oceans is a shared responsibility. We need a wide range of stakeholders on board. I commend the UN Global Compact for its efforts to mobilize the ocean industries. We will not succeed without their commitment and capacity. Last year, the high-level panel for a uh, sustainable ocean economy presented recommendations and an ambitious action agenda. We shot out where we think the world should be at the end of this crucial decade. The decade of action to deliver the SDGs and the decade of ocean science. The panel's action agenda should form uh, the starting point for discussions on the oceans in the time ahead. We need to move away from businesses as usual towards transformation. The oceans can help us solve some of the world's most pressing challenges. The oceans play an important role in increasing the planet's resilience to climate change. And the oceans can provide climate solutions to reduce emission gaps. At scale, carbon capture and storage Green shipping and offshore wind power are some of the most promising areas. CCS technology can cut emissions substantially in a range of industrial processes. Norway is seeking to speed up the development and deployment of this technology internationally. Green shipping and the global transition to zero emission shipping will be vital. The Norwegian maritime industry is among those leading the way. We urge the international community to increase its ambitions in this area. And as costs come down, the offshore wind sector also offers huge potential. We need to focus on how we can improve the health of the oceans, how we can conserve biodiversity and ecosystems and scale up restoration efforts. With food insecurity on the rise, the oceans can play a key part in combating hunger and malnutrition. The oceans can provide many times more food than they do today. At the UN Food Systems Summit la later this week, we will propose a science-based approach aimed at increasing production and consumption of aquatic foods. Without healthy, productive oceans, we all face an uncertain future. Promoting ocean health is crucial to achieving the future we want. The future set out in the 2030 agenda. The Ocean Panel is now working to develop a global partnership to take the international ocean agenda to the next level. The aim is to ensure more sustainable use of the oceans. We need a multi-stakeholder approach. Only through collaboration can we achieve the results we need to build a sustainable ocean economy. The private sector and the Global Compact Ocean Platform have a decisive role to play in this. And I look forward to our continued partnership.
Many thanks, uh, Prime Minister Suvla, for these inspiring and important remarks. And I'd also like to thank the government of Norway for the strong support of the UN Global Compact and the ocean work for the last four years. I would now like to invite on screen the panelists of our next session, Ms. Sandra Ujambo, CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, the Honorable Mohamed Elmi, Deputy Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Kenya, and Mrs. Stula Henriksen, UN Global Compact Special Advisor, Ocean. Dear Sandra, I would like to turn to you first to tell us a little bit more about the transition to the Ocean Stewardship Coalition. The screen is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Eric. Um, and excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for the annual UN Global Compact high-level meeting on ocean. And it's happening against the backdrop of the UN General Assembly and our flagship private sector forum. This year's Uniting Business Live event, hosted by the UN Global Compact, will once again convene virtually, bringing together thousands of leaders to take stock, identify areas for action, and drive business ambition on the global goals. Since its launch in 2018, the Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform has brought together leading governments, companies, NGOs, academic institutions, and UN partners to determine how ocean industries can deliver on the global goals. This collaboration has helped to shape the global ocean sustainability agenda and has driven action for a healthy and productive ocean. Initially launched as a platform of 40 committed stakeholders, the work has rapidly grown over the last three years to involve almost 300, all committed to demonstrating stewardship in the ocean and looking into the action platform for tools and guidance. As a cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder platform, it is uniquely positioned to respond to the interconnected challenges faced by the blue economy actors from seafood companies to the maritime sector. Our sustainable ocean principles, which were launched in 2019 and developed with hundreds of stakeholders worldwide, serve as a strong baseline. They build upon the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact to provide a framework for responsible business practices in the ocean. To ensure this collaboration continues in an inclusive manner, as well as to broaden the work of the action platform, we here are truly delighted to announce the exciting next phase of the Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform as it transitions to become the Ocean Stewardship Coalition. The Ocean Stewardship Coalition will offer a forum for continued long-term collaboration among the hundreds of stakeholders already engaged in this work. The coalition will also allow the UN Global Compact to reach a broader membership, which in turn will also help us scale up the global collective impact of sustainable ocean businesses amongst SMEs and other smallholders. Each year, our high-level meeting on ocean provides opportunity to take stock of progress and identify key areas of action required to deliver on the 2030 agenda. These include sustainable food, transport, energy, and opportunities for inclusive economic development. Critically, the ocean is also potentially the largest nature-based solution to the climate crisis. The latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showed us that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warning to 1.5 or even two degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. The upcoming COP26 conference is a pivotal moment as the time frame to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees rapidly narrows. At the UN Global Compact, we want to increase awareness that ocean action is indeed climate action. To increase recognition of ocean-based climate solutions and support a successful outcome for the conference, in March, 2021, the UN Global Compact embarked on a blue road to COP26. The blue road has brought together over 100 stakeholders from business, policymaking, NGOs, and science to advance four ocean-based climate solutions, zero emission maritime transport, offshore renewable energy, low carbon blue food, and ocean-based nature solutions. The collaboration has resulted in a set of recommendations and actions for leaders to harness these four solutions towards COP26 and beyond. These are outlined in our newly launched blueprint for a climate smart ocean. And so building on this momentum, the newly established Ocean Stewardship Coalition will further accelerate climate smart ocean business. The coalition is therefore launching with a renewed focus on the ocean climate nexus and the ocean's next role in addressing our planetary crises. 
The coalition will work towards strengthening the sustainable ocean business case for climate action, while the Blue Road continues to provide guidance and tools for businesses to integrate climate, ocean, and planetary considerations into their operations and to deliver on a 1.5 degree future. Businesses have a vital role to play future we want and ensuring no one is left behind. And only through collective action can we put the world on a trajectory to achieve the global goals and a just transition to a net zero future. So I'll close by thanking all of you for joining today and contributing to this important discussion. I look forward to listening and to the continued collaboration of the Ocean Stewardship Coalition. Thank you very much. Over back to you, Eric. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra. Great to hear that. And I would now like to pass the screen over to the UN Global Compact Special Advisor on Ocean, Stulla Henriksen, to tell us a little more about the objectives of the coalition. Stulla, the screen is yours. So thank you, Eric. Prime Minister, Minister, Excellencies, dear friends, the ocean plays a vital, ever more important role in our common quest for the future that we want, as laid out in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Global warming and environmental degradation are accelerating at a fast pace. Each report from the IPCC is presenting increasingly dire warnings, and only a few weeks ago, the UN Secretary General issued a code red for humanity. The ocean itself is in a dire state. Marine ecosystems are suffering increasing pressure from rising temperatures, deoxygenation, pollution, overfishing, and growing coastal populations. And it is becoming an increasingly busy space for human activities. The ocean is a crucial key to the solution and an important part of the problem. Stripped of wishful talk and thinking, the bottom line is that humanity is facing existential threats requiring joint and swift actions of unprecedented scope, scale, and urgency, as Sandra just referred. We are running out of time. And importantly, this cannot be just yet another industrial revolution, because this time is profoundly different. We basically need to transition our entire society from a state of fossil fuel dependency to new zero emission equilibrium. We need to do it fast in a few decades, and we cannot afford to fail. And this is perfectly possible. Together, we have the means and possess the know-how, but we need the will, dedication, and determination. And we cannot succeed if we approach these as mere matters of technological innovations and incremental operational evolutions. There is a fast growing realization that changes must become more rapid more extensive and more disruptive than previously thought. We need a systemic shift. The transition to zero will require changes to our lifestyles and how we organize our society. It will alter our patterns of consumption and production. It will require large scale industrial restructuring, redirection of massive financial flows and reskilling of large parts of the workforce. The transition to zero will generate a redistribution of business, opportunities, jobs, incomes, wealth, and welfare, and of people's hopes, fears, and dreams for the future. As always, changes to the status quo will be met by strong adverse forces, openly behind the scenes or as undercurrents below the surface. Also, without a general perception of fairness, the actions needed will fail fail to obtain popular support and legitimacy. Therefore, it is imperative that the transition's massive potential for economic and social gains be distributed in a just and equitable manner across demographics, national boundaries, and social groups. To ensure a widely accepted license to change and to breed the ground for new policy initiatives and regulatory measures, we need to develop a common understanding and compelling narrative of the immense value of zero, benefiting humanity and society at large, and correspondingly, the cost of doing nothing or too little. The contributions of the ocean should be recognized by all. The ocean is the planet's largest biosphere, hosting vitally important ecosystems and serving as a huge carbon sink for the entire planet. For the world's 150 literal states, it provides space for aquaculture and offshore production of renewable electricity, 
offering vast opportunities for local jobs and value creation, and not least, representing a true democratization of access to healthy food and clean energy. The ocean surface provides a ready-made maintenance-free infrastructure for zero emission tourism, leisure, and local transportation of people, and not least for an emission-free international exchange of goods, the backbone of the global economy. The blue space is home to vast marine resources that can contribute to better and more prosperous lives for a growing world population, provided we manage them in a healthy, in a uh, responsible, sustainable manner, and ensure that the ocean remains clean, healthy, and protected. In short, this is what defines the overall context, the core of our mission, the scope of our work, and the pretext for the Ocean Stewardship Coalition that we are launching today. We are eagerly looking forward to cooperating with you all. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Back to you, Eric. Many thanks, Dula. I think that was an inspiring uh, intervention. Uh, I think your point on license to change uh, and the uh, added value of zero compared to the costs of doing nothing is extremely important for the businesses going forward. Uh, and to realize the potential of the ocean, policy, of course, plays a key role. Upcoming negotiations and conferences will be essential. Both the COP26 and the upcoming UN Ocean Conference represent some key milestones for us to come together and take ambitious positions on this. To tell us more about how ocean climate solutions have been incorporated into Kenya's NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, and how we can keep up momentum for ocean action from COP26 to the UN Ocean Conference in June next year, I would like to, to pass over to the Honorable Mohamed Elmi, Deputy Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Kenya. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, moderator and uh, excellencies. Um, Kenya, I mean, we all agree, and as previous speakers have said, the oceans are critical for our survival. Uh, on COP26 uh, is a key milestone, we all agree, to ensure that uh, ocean health and climate uh, is uh, dealt with once and for all decisively. Our team that is being led by the cabinet secretary will be going there and that they are prioritizing uh, the ocean's health and they will be making uh, serious uh, presentations and uh, decisions on a whole range of it from biodiversity to litter and uh, plastic pollutions. Uh, Kenya's first NDC did not have the oceans. Our second NDC has included uh, oceans as a critical one and they have prioritized mangrove ecosystem management uh, as our uh, one of our uh, focus on the NDC. Kenya generally is leading on a number of initiatives that we hope will help with the ocean uh, protection. That is our blue economy. Uh, they, we have recently uh, created a coast guard to protect, to monitor uh, illegal fishing and other destruction our mangrove program of restoration and sustainability. We have also, um, in Kenya, we have uh, the private sector, uh, one of the largest in Africa, you know, in terms of the network that are working uh, closely with the Kenya government. On the, and again, uh, in terms of how do we move from COP26 to UN Oceans, our view is that uh, the, we need to better coordinate the existing initiatives and, uh, you know, where is it? So we don't need too many new initiatives that actually are working on the same. And I'll list a number of them. I mean, okay, for uh, one is just the one we have, the uh, UN Global uh, Compact, the Blue Economy, the Mangrove Restoration uh, Initiative that is going, um, uh, restoration and uh, uh, sustainability. The Great Blue Wall, which is the new, uh, you know, um, sea space initiative that is coming. And a number of these will actually fall under that. The ocean uh, biodiversity is a whole range of them. So my view is that we should have all these uh, put under uh, a proper coordination 
So we better increase our coordination, consolidate and upscale the existing initiatives and actually find additional financing that is required. And uh, the, this and the finances should be available and we must carry our communities along. And uh, science must be made available. Capacity building is made available to communities that live uh, and the professionals who live um, uh, next to the oceans. And therefore, we must act now. Uh, there will be many conferences. We, we should download all the science that is already there. The best practice is already there. For us to move forward, we need just to simplify the language better the coordination, have the additional resources, and we know where it's coming from, and then actually monitor that. And uh, we must bring our populations together. A lot of people do not know, uh, they think they're living too far from the ocean. When you talk of the ocean, they think it doesn't concern them. But science tells us that oceans is what is keeping us going and that there will be a problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Many thanks, Mohamed El Me, and I, I totally agree with you. And I think, well, of course, there are many initiatives, and I'm sure all of them are looking forward to come to Lisbon uh, to do a UN Ocean Conference, uh, co-hosted by Kenya and Portugal in June next year. And of course, we need to coordinate and collaborate. This is a job for the world, is our greatest common good, the ocean. And it's a big undertaking that we not, both need the private sector, we need the science, and we need good governance. So thanks to the first panels of excellent speakers. I will now like to open the second panel and welcome on the screen, Mr. Stephen Cotton, General Secretary of the International Transport Workers Federation, Ms. Inger Andersen, Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, Ms. Mary Quaine, CEO of Mainstream Renewables, Ms. Daniela Fernandez, Founder and CEO of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and Ms. Kerstin Broughton, CEO of DNB Bank. But let let me first give all of you some context, because today also launch, uh, marks the launch of our UN Global Compact Blueprint for a Climate Smart Ocean to meet the 1.5 degree target. It's part of our Blue Road to COP, as earlier mentioned, which is a multi-year program that looks at the role of ocean and climate change. The Blueprint lays out a path forward for both policymakers and businesses leaders to drive a climate smart ocean solution. In short, the blueprint have identified six key steps. Firstly, we need to call on policymakers to include the ocean climate nexus in political processes, especially including the COP26, but also COP15 on UN by uh, the UN Biodiversity Convention. Secondly, we encourage private sector to engage in ocean management. This is not for governments alone. We need the business voice in smart ocean management of the oceans. Thirdly, and very important, we call on all ocean-based companies to take urgent, urgent action and set a science-based targets to align with the 1.5 degree trajectory. Fourthly, we call on businesses and policy leaders to uh, adopt a human-centered approach by addressing environmental injustices in climate smart policies. Fifthly, we call for more sustainable blue finance, and I'm sure we're going to return to this because it will be a key enabler to identify climate smart solutions that actually are profitable. And last but not least, we call for collaboration and data collection to be strengthened, particularly for the upcoming year and decade of ocean science. I hope you have uh, time to read the blueprint. It's posted in the chat. It's available on the Global Compact websites. The Blue Road continues its hard work to the COP26 and beyond to the next two COPs. I'm looking forward to work with all of you on that road. And now I want to turn to our first speaker, Ms. Inger Andersen, Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme. We know that ocean nature-based solutions such as blue carbon ecosystems from seaweed to coral reefs can address the twin crises of biodiversity and climate change. One of our Blueprint's main recommendations is to, is to use the COP26 as a bridge to raise this awareness. And my question to you, Ms. Inger Andersen, in your opinion, how can we use COP26 to raise awareness and bridge climate and nature? And what can business do to be part of this? 
Well, this is such a good question. The day after we get the uh, UNFCCC's report issues on the NDCs as they stand today, and when we look at today's NDCs, we will have seen that they are by far not ambitious enough, which is why we need business and everyone else, while we also need governments to stretch. Because if we just deliver what countries have promised, then we land at 2.7 degrees in, seven, in 2100, which is obviously not where we want to be. But we need to understand also that oceans today are responsible for a significant uh, proportion of food security for people across the world. A one in 10 of the population of 7 billion rely on the oceans for their livelihoods, fisheries, agriculture, uh, aquaculture, or a derivative in the services of these. So, and then there is the the very identity, the treasures, the, the of, of the spiritual and recreational benefits that we all hold uh, dear, right? So there is, and, and then the carbon sink and the nature, which you ask about. But I think it's important that we frame it in this setting. Mm. And I often speak about the oceans being this innocent in that the oceans can't help but take whatever we throw at it. We put carbon into the air, the oceans will absorb it. It can't help it. We put pollution in the waterways, uh, too much pesticides, insecticides, and fertilizers, the oceans will receive it. We put plastics in, an, in our garbage, it will end in the oceans. And, and obviously, we overfish or destroy our mangroves, the oceans will suffer. So that means that the oceans really are this place where actions begin and end for long-term sustainability. So what should businesses be doing? Well, first we need to understand that circularity has to be part and parcel of everything we do. This idea that we can uh, take, make and waste is yesterday's. We are 7 billion on this good planet and we cannot just extract, pollute and assume that the ocean can continue to give us what it gives us. So moving from linear to circular is absolutely critical. That will solve, and obviously reducing and reusing at the same time. Uh, that's part and parcel of it. And that is part, if we look, and we're in the middle of negotiating the post-2020 frameworks So for biodiversity, target seven deals with reducing pollution. Target eight uh, and 15 has specificities to the role of businesses. And so in that negotiations, we are calling on businesses to lean in, stand up and alter their production line. But we also are recognized that. So the first thing, circularity. But secondly, we also recognize that businesses need a nudge to move there. And so part of that is to review the very harmful subsidies. Yes, we can talk about uh, hydrocarbon subsidies, but for a moment, let me talk about the subsidies that go to the fishing sector. And never make the fishing communities our enemies, please. Huh? But we need to understand how do we subsidize these vital uh, communities that service us with our food in such a way that they can uh, harvest and, and provide that food, but provide it sustainably. Today, the WTO is deep in negotiation on ending harmful subsidies. It is critical that large fishing nations lean in, step in, and that private sector leans in and understands this because anyhow it's in our long-term benefit, but also subsidies in the agricultural sector. And my last point, because I realize you have to draw it to a close, is businesses can really push on innovation and to accelerate the finance flows. Now, if governments make a gear shift on the, on the, on the sort of subsidies that push us in the sustainable direction, if we combine with nature-based and technology-based solutions, we can have massive resources flowing into nature-based solutions. And today that is not happening at the level where we would like it to be. But right now we are pumping money into the economy, 15 trillion it appears, uh, to restart the economic wheels. Surely, this is my last one, we're not gonna leave the next generation with a mountain of debt because this is money we borrowed from them and a broken planet. So now is the time for us all to lean in. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Eric. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I think you uh, finished very on a high note here because uh, I mean, I think business not only need a nudge in the right direction, 
we need good governance so that it's profitable to be part of this transition to the zero degree, 1.5 degree target in, in 2100. And, and Stula put it uh, wisely, the added value of getting to zero. That is something up for business. I would like to turn to you, Ms. Mary Quaine, CEO of Mainstream Renewable Power. Uh, our blueprint also highlights the need for climate smart planning to balance mitigation, adaptation, and biodiversity. We see that there's a need for a massive scale up of offshore renewable energy as a clean source, not only for land-based, but also ocean-based uh, transport and, and production. So my question to you, Ms. Mary Quinn, is in your opinion, what are the main barriers and bottlenecks to scale up the offshore renewable energy so that we can meet the Paris targets? Thank you, Eric. First of all, um, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here today and to, to be speaking on behalf of the, of the offshore wind industry and, you know, to hear um, from the other speakers the, the leadership focus on the oceans and the build up to, to COP26. Um, at Mainstream, we are active members of the Ocean Renewable Energy Coalition, which was formed in response to the call to action by the High Level Panel on Sustainable Oceans. So it's such a core focus for us. Um, so let me just start with some context on the role of offshore wind in the road to, to 2050. Um, both the International Energy Agency and the International Renewable Energy Agency have stated that for the world to meet a 1.5 degree Celsius climate change pathway, that we need to rapidly electrify the global energy sector. According to both agencies, by 2050, electricity will provide over half the world's energy um, an increase from 20% today, and of that 90% will be delivered by wind and solar power. Mm -hmm. um, offshore wind is simply the single largest scalable technology that can deliver low cost bulk generation to markets right across the Asia's, um, Americas, Africa, Europe. But you know, as, as you rightly point out, the policy environment needs to improve rapidly in order for offshore wind to reach those targets. Today, offshore wind is only 2% of what the world needs to get to net zero by 2050. So, you know, a very, a very significant journey ahead of us. And accelerating the growth of fixed and floating offshore wind would unlock huge potential for the displacement of fossil fuels. And offshore wind is very much a transformative socioeconomic force um, with the, the potential to create and does create large scale green manufacturing jobs and infrastructure investment which can revitalize coastal communities and ports, redeploy the highly skilled global oil and gas workforce, and reduce countries' reliance on the imports of hydrocarbons so that they can refocus their investment priorities. Um, a growing group of countries now have identified offshore wind as a key technology for reaching climate targets, but governments now need to follow up on commitments and work with industry to allow that investment to scale up rapidly. So to answer your question, what are the barriers? for um, offshore and marine renewables to accelerate to the annual installation rate that's needed to meet the net zero targets, we need to meet a number of key milestones. So for example, in many countries with significant offshore potential, there's no clear ownership of the seabed. Many governments will need to clarify that ownership and then determine how they will license areas for development. Um, the next step will be the adoption of national targets for offshore wind and marine renewables, common standards for environmental impact assessments, integrated ocean planning, and the planning and codification of potentially competing claims to access to and use of marine resources in a sustainable fashion. The UN FCCC Climate Action Pathway for Oceans and Coastal Zones outlines several milestones to 2050 and is a really useful guide to action. And the recent World Bank roadmaps for offshore wind for countries, including Vietnam, offer you know, essential and helpful guidance. And to really maximize the opportunities in this sector, what I would point to most significantly is the need to see governments, industry, and other marine stakeholders working together on access to relevant marine data, build out of transnational grids, multi-stakeholder marine spatial planning, and the efficiency of regional supply chains. And if I could take uh, just another few moments um, to refer to the example of the UK's Offshore Wind Programme Board, which is an excellent example of industry and government coming together. Back in 2012, the UK government issued a challenge to the UK's offshore wind sector, which was to reduce the cost of your power 
to under 100 pounds per megawatt hour by 2020. So it would be price competitive with new nuclear. And then in turn, the government would procure large amounts of new offshore wind. And then the critical development was that industry and government came together to identify and to remove the barriers to investment in offshore wind. The finance, energy, industry and planning ministries joined with developers and turbine manufacturers with cross industry sector and planned how to build a wholly new industry and it worked. So if I just leave you with, with those words, and um, that very much you know, speaks to, to the truth as to how to get to low cost, large scale investment with all the jobs and local content that then come with it. If government and industry work together on a plan that looks forward over at least a 10 year horizon and all parts of government, particularly the finance ministry to be crucially involved at the center. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Quayne, for those perspectives. And I think it's, a, it's a, such a compelling idea to have this growth if we get it right. And it, it's a, also a difference of energy resource uh, management planning for uh, countries all over the world. You are not uh, stuck with uh, the, the five, six big oil hubs in the world uh, because you can produce offshore wind so many places if you get it right and at a price parity, uh, which is... Uh, uh, within reach, of course. Um, uh, one sector that is totally dependent on uh, cheap green energy in the next uh, uh, three decades is, of course, shipping. And I would like to turn to you, Mr. Stephen Cotton, uh, General Secretary for the ITF. Uh, as you know, we launched our new shipping brief at the UN Global Compact today, charting a 1.5 uh, degree trajectory for maritime transport as part of our blue road to COP26 extremely important that the shipping community urgently decarbonize by 2050 if we are to meet uh, the targets of the Paris Agreement. So my question to you is, is uh, Stephen, what does the transition to zero carbon mean for the maritime workforce and how can they best be best prepared? And how can we ensure that such a transition is just and leave no one behind? Thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak. I'm here on behalf of our 17 million transport workers, but it's also my first outing on behalf of Labour in the UN Global Compact as a, as a board member. But I think it's critical, and you know, the, the preceding speakers highlighted the, the challenging situation we find ourselves in. But I think it's critical, certainly on behalf of Labour, that we put forward an ambitious and a very positive programme. Yes, it's a massive, a massive challenge, but it's also critical from workers' perspective that if we do this right, and we just heard an excellent example, that transition to zero carbon can be a big, and I mean a big opportunity for workers, for decent pay, decent jobs, and frankly, safer workplaces. First, let's start with ambitious, accountable targets. International shipping must, I mean must, target zero carbon by 2050, despite being outside the Paris Agreement. Global emissions targets will not be met without direct action by all of the stakeholders. Industry needs to act. Governments need to act by setting firm zero carbon tar targets multilaterally in the IMO or by including shipping as part of the challenges included in Paris. Good news, good news is that we know how to decarbonize shipping. Technology already exists and or in, are in later stages of development. Shipping does not need new technological breakthroughs. It needs significant structural change in the same way as we're thinking about human rights due diligence and how to drive behavioral change right across the global supply chain. We need a just transition to protect health and safety of workers, but to create good quality, dare I say unionized jobs based on the ILO's just transition principles but we need solid sectorial labour market policies and strong social protection. Lower emissions do not mean fewer jobs or, or less opportunities for workers, both on board ships, but in the supply chain that will service ships. And it does not necessarily mean we have to deteriorate working conditions. Let's reflect on safety. Green shipping must be safe. Shipping. We cannot in any sense see any of the workers in this process exposed by the new fuels or the biofuels, and we need strong international safety standards and effective, effective enforcement mechanisms. And health and safety reps and union engagement 
can be all part of this process. Training will be integral to health and safety on ships and in the supply chains that will deliver the new fuels. Workers will need to have necessary on the job use to new tech training for new technology, but not just as passive uh, receivers, but also as co-creators and engagement about understanding why we need to upskill and understand the ideological challenges we face. It's critical that these new transitions, including green supply chains from fuel production, as we heard, uh, from fuel production to electrical generation and bunkering in ports, it's critical we offer renewed training and upskilling for all of the workers in the process. Just on that point, I think it's critical that we also look at what does this mean for young people and the opportunity to engage young people. We've seen the horrendous impact of COVID on young workers and it's vital that they're part of this process and the industry prepares for that. And it would be um, unacceptable for me to not recognise that decarbonisation gives us an opportunity, particularly in shipping, to deal with the fact we only have 1.3% of the workforce from the women workers of the world. This is critical and it must be responded to. So to summarise, green shipping and a resilient maritime supply chain can only build, be built on good engagement and decent work. We're completely convinced that the fantastic work that's been done by the Global Compact on the Blue Road to COP26 being launched today gives us a clear pathway about how to respond. My commitment on behalf of all the ITF's affiliates is we're ready to work with all stakeholders and we're ready to make sure there is sufficient access to investment and funding to make sure it's a global recovery and including, including Global South. We're ready to stand with all of our colleagues inside the sector and it's critical that we now make sure that we're in a position to promote seafarers and protect their livelihoods, their jobs, their work faces and their families. And let's not talk, let's not forget many of our seafarers come from countries potentially impacted by the global warming. So on behalf of all the Labour voices here, and I was last week we attended uh, London Shipping Week, there is a sense of change. There is a feeling that employers are ready to take this challenge and it's through formats like today and the great work of the Global Compact that we will all be collectively able to be ambitious, to be bold and to be positive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And uh, I, I totally agree with you. I think this is the opportunity of a century, this massive transition that we are now in the beginning of and moving into where we need decisive action and we need collective action that has you know, a global scale. And that brings me over to the next speaker because that should be a business opportunity. We cannot subsidize ourselves to 2030, even less to 2050. Uh, we have to identify uh, the projects and the businesses that can you know, be profitable in the long term within good management regulations. So my question to you, Ms. Kersti Broughton, CEO at DNB is, what will be the role of banks and how can they help clients increase their impact on the sustainable ocean economies? And what are the challenges or barriers that needs to be addressed? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eric, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here to share some thoughts and, and for the opportunity to listen to all the great speakers uh, ahead of me. Uh, uh, we certainly believe that banks and financial institutions have a, an important role to play, and we are very eager to play uh, that role. And I think it, it involves responding to some of the recommendations that you mentioned uh, from your uh, blueprint. I think, first of all, or the overarching thought is maybe that we can have play a role in combining the, the macro uh, overall ambitions with each of the individual companies and, and the micro initiatives that we need to see happening in order to solve the grand challenges that we're facing, but that also contains a lot of opportunities for, for many companies and businesses uh, around the world. Uh, the first thing I would point to uh, is related to data, as you also talked about. I think we know of the emissions uh, and we know that we need to go to zero. Uh, banks and financial institutions can contribute in terms of providing transparency on this information. I mean, right now we're working with our uh, clients to report not only uh, our emissions that are very limited, but actually the emissions of each and one of the companies that we're working with so that we make sure we have a transparent baseline 
and we can actually measure the progress we're making as we start progressing towards uh, reaching the targets that seem to be common for a lot now to be to be net zero by 2050. Important in this is uh, uh, the taxonomy uh, that EU has uh, led, uh, taken the lead on uh, to make sure that we all talk about the same thing that when we talk about what is green, what is blue, what is sustainable and what is not. Secondly, obviously financing. There is the need for tremendous investments, not only in building the new industries around uh, and within the ocean, but also transforming the industries that are there today, like shipping that was just being, being talked about. Uh, thirdly, we evaluate all of our customers today uh, and ask them about their ambitions. And we will take a role of actually following them up and make sure that they move towards their ambitions. Otherwise, this will have a consequence on their ability to fund and raise capital for future uh, investments. We collectively need to build competence, not only on the challenge, but also on how to solve this. And we certainly see, I mean, we are the largest bank in, in Norway, which is a small small company in the world, and but we work with every third business in Norway. And we see that how we build competence by talking uh, with our customers, and we spread this across meeting other of our customers. So I think financial institutions, investors, banks across the world can actually uh, contribute to uh, building the competence that we are uh, building in, in silos more broadly and spread and spread this across. We, we have taken a very uh, firm uh, point of view, thinking that this is related to a transition. The whole world goes through a transition. It is about building new industries that we heard about uh, for with, with mainstream as an example, but it's also about transforming shipping, uh, fossil fuel-based industry that needs to be uh, gradually phased out, but we need to reduce emissions faster than we actually phase out some of these industries. So we have said that uh, that impacting, being a player that impacts the development is actually more important than excluding. Because if we just exclude and turn our backs, well, very often we actually find that the activities pop up may, maybe in different structures that are not as transparent, not as regulated, and not as included in the governance that we're all talking about that we need to join in uh, with regards to ensuring that the development is as desired. Uh, so we have said we will do both. Uh, we will fund, uh, we've targeted an amount of 1,500 1, billion kroner uh, for sustainable investments by, by 2030. We do experience a, uh, a tremendous reallocation of capital as we speak towards sustainable solutions, and we do expect that to scale. And we have set concrete targets to reduce our indirect emissions from our oil and gas portfolio, maritime portfolio, as well as our property portfolio. So we see our role very much as being an accelerator to the shift that we have uh, ahead of us. As one of the leading ocean banks of the world, uh, we have been instrumental in developing what is called the Poseidon uh, Principles. Uh, this is uh, uh, a taxon like the US, US te uh, EU taxonomy for, uh, for shipping. And we also very much uh, agree with previous speakers who have talked about the need to collaborate across sectors, across industries, across value chains to find the solutions. Are there challenges? You talked about barriers. I think there are more challenges to be aware of than, than actual barriers that are uh, insurmountable, but I think uh, they need to be met through cooperation and they need to be met by working together to make sure that we have as common standard as possible, because this is what will enable us to move forward in a joint force to, to solve what is actually a, a global problem as well as an opportunity at our hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sassin, and, and I totally agree with you. I think we need a common approach, a principled approach, as we are, of course, big fans of the Global Compi. The Poseidon principles have become an important part of the sustainable ocean principles that was launched at the UN General Assembly in 2019, together with the UNFI and the, of the works of uh, some of the World Bank and other key financial institutions, and now ICMA. We are 
trying to pave the way for blue bonds. And this is something that we will work more on in our annual working meeting every Tuesday in the high level week. So that's tomorrow. Normally we meet at the boat house in Central Park. This time around, that will also be virtually. That's how the world is this year. But thanks again, Shash. I think it's an important contribution from a bank to take a bold position, but also to be you know, up to speed with the, these processes because the EU taxonomy needs input, the UN needs input, and together we have to find viable ways of reaching these targets. So thanks uh, to all our speakers in this panel. Uh, and I would like to turn attention to our two final speakers for some closing remarks. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Honorable Dr. Jane Lubchenko, Deputy Director for Climate and Environment, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, United States. Please, Lubchenko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Excellencies, distinguished participants, congratulations on a very productive high-level meeting on the ocean. My thanks to the UN Global Compact for the opportunity to join you today and to offer my thanks to everyone here for all that you do to support a sustainable, healthy, and people-centered ocean and planet. I'm thrilled that the Ocean Stewardship Coalition is now launched. Co collaboration, ambition, action. These are needed now more than ever before. And as many of you have noted, this is a critical time for the world. The recent IPCC report made it crystal clear that to stay within the 1.5 degree target to keep it in sight, countries must greatly enhance their efforts to decrease emissions. Therefore, ambitious ocean climate action in advance of next month's COP26 is exactly what the world needs. Ocean action is climate action. And the business sector is key to success of this in partnership with governments. Science tells us that every degree of warming matters and every amount of avoided warming will make a difference. We must therefore rapidly deploy every responsible tool in our toolbox. And that includes the long neglected but powerful ocean-based solutions. Yes, the ocean is a victim of climate change, but it's also a treasure trove of solutions. Moreover, many of the ocean-based climate solutions are particularly powerful because they achieve both mitigation and adaptation goals with the same actions. They provide co-benefits such as protecting biodiversity, reducing pollution, increasing coastal resilience and supporting sustainable fisheries. Now, many of you have already highlighted some of the ocean-based solutions that are ripe for deployment, harnessing ocean renewable energy, protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems on coasts and in the open ocean, protecting existing stores of carbon, hotspots of carbon on the seafloor and biodiversity through fully protected marine protected areas and decarbonizing shipping. These ocean-based solutions will help us achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And everyone here is key to making that happen. Mm -hmm. The upcoming climate negotiations provide several opportunities for nations to mobilize ocean climate solutions. The COP26 decision text itself can encourage ocean climate action and create a home to discuss ocean issues in the climate regime. Outside the scope of the formal negotiations, nations and businesses will also have opportunities to make announcements and commitments. For example, to promote shipping decarbonization, scale up offshore renewable energy and protect blue carbon ecosystems. And of course, we should look beyond COP26 for continued opportunities to hold ourselves accountable, to share successes and pledges to do more. The US is partnering with Palau on the, our ocean conference in February. And of course the UN ocean conference follows that. So start planning now to use these opportunities to carry the momentum on ocean climate action into the new year. The stars are aligning for action on both an international and national stages. This really is an all hands on deck moment for leaders of business, science, academia, governments, civil society, and UN partners come together to raise global ambition 
on ocean climate action. This is a time for vision, for leadership, and for action. It's time for a quantum leap in our efforts to harness the power of the ocean to solve the climate and nature crises and therefore enable global communities to be healthy, safe, and prosperous. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lubchenko. And I totally agree with you. It's all hands on deck. Uh, we've been hearing that all through day. And that's why we are very happy to launch the coalition. It's open for all UNGC members. It's free to join. And there are special sponsorship avenues to take to take very specific action tracks further to develop offshore wind, to understand waste man management, or to share data science, etc. But uh, I think you're correct, uh, Dr. Lubchenko. This is a, a key moment in time. And next year, we will meet in Lisbon for the UN Ocean Conference. And now I would like to turn to Your Excellency, Mr. Ricardo Santos, Minister of Sea for Portugal, co-host of the UN Ocean Conference. He will provide some uh, remarks on the upcoming milestone conference next year in Lisbon. Please, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Excellencies, honorable ministers, government representatives, special envoy directors, in a few words, dear ocean fellows and SDG supporters. Uh, today we come together to celebrate the establishment of the Ocean Stewardship Coalition and the release of two important documents, the blueprint for a climate uh, smart ocean to meet 1.5 degrees Celsius and the brief charting and the brief uh, charting of uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius trajectory for maritime transport. And I would like to congratulate the United Nations Global Compact for this new renewed strategic ambition. When the United Nations Ocean Conference was planned, it proposed a firm agenda turning into action the Sustainable Development Goal 14, framed by the idea of a call for action set out in the 2017, 2017 sorry, Ocean Conference. This new, new way to engage with the ocean, more inclusive and more connected, is now our goal for 2022. During these past one and a half years, the world stood still but the planet didn't. As Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently stated, and I was pleased to see this quoted opening the blueprint for a climate smart ocean to meet 1.5 degrees Celsius, the IPCC Working Group 1 report is a code red for humanity. I want to join in on the spirit of this section and the important work of bringing business to the front run of this needed challenge. And I want to rekindle here today, the tone of the conference, the need to scale up ocean action. This is the process that we must pick up now again, to strive for tangible, ambitious, transformative action that can help us deliver a meaningful conference next year and the fulfillment of SDG 14 targets in 2030. Portugal was closely engaged in promoting an autonomous sustainable de sorry, development goal dedicated to the oceans. As you have been outspoken supporters of important process taking place internationally, such as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable uh, Development, that acutely reminds us that science and innovation are critical and cross-cutting to our ocean aspect. After the first United Nations Ocean Conference that we co-facilitated alongside Singapore, we remain proudly engaged in co-hosting with Kenya the second United Nations Ocean Conference. We are aware of the fact that the United Nations Ocean Conference is part of a bigger framework that includes also the upcoming COP in Glasgow, the work conducted by the Global, Pact, Global Compact and the involvement of many other stakeholders 
working to realign our current knowledge towards global responsibility. But after this transformative year, you have more than ever the necessity and the opportunity to effectively address the issue of conservation and sustainable use of the ocean. So let's put our hands to work to ensure that we pick up this process, not where we left it, but improved by all the experience of this year and a half, good and bad, and by the change we envision for our societies. Portugal remains proud and grateful to be working alongside Kenya in this endeavor, and will feel honored and prepared to host the United Nations Ocean Conference in 2022 from June 27 to 1st of July. I invite you all to come to Lisbon next year to full steam ahead our goal of achieving SDG 14. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister, and thank you again for Portugal's great partnership with our work on Ocean at the Global Compact. Thank you for the invitation. I extend it to everybody online here. We will meet in Portugal. Hopefully, we'll also meet in maybe in Glasgow before that. Yeah. But I'm so glad you all could take part in this online UN General Assembly in the United Nations, United Business Live from the UN Global Compact. We'll work more together soon. Some of us will meet at the working meetings tomorrow and hope to see you all soon, uh, if not in Glasgow or not or before. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.